I was born and raised in Seattle, Washington, in, in the city, yeah, Seward Park, the south end of the city. Uh, we, my dad had a commercial halibut fishing boat, so grew up uh, in an interesting family. He was Norwegian, my mom was Irish Catholic. So there, there's, that's a good combination. Yeah. And uh, so, uh, I learned what hard work was on a fishing boat and figured out that that was not a career path that I wanted to pursue. And my dad was pretty, pretty cool with that, so. Uh, and considering the, the, our fishing boats on the bottom of the Gulf of Alaska, that turned out to be a great career decision. It's a six day run. It's, a, six, it's days? six days to, to go up there. Um, and then you would fish you know, for whatever the length the, 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 sea, the, the, uh, the period would be. Um, typically, you know, 10, 14 days of fishing, in, unless you filled the boat before then. So our, our boat would hold uh, a little over 60,000 pounds of fish. Uh, so, um, and then based on the price, in Seattle versus Petersburg, Alaska, uh, they make a decision whether or not to bring the fish down to Seattle or not. If they did, you know, obviously you had that transit time, but sometimes it was 50 or 60 cents a pound difference, you know, on 60,000 pounds, that's a lot of money. I went on one, one serious halibut trip that did it for me, then, um, they, they would fish from April to August for halibut, and August through September for albacore tuna off of the Washington and Oregon coast. Now, tuna fishing, that was, a, that was a lot more fun. Didn't make as much money, but it was a lot more fun. There's, you know, because you didn't get the heck beat out of you when you're packing the chest cavity of a 300 pound halibut and it starts flapping away and just slaps you silly and you know there's nothing you can do because it doesn't even have a head on it it's just the nerves going north of 300 pounds you know some of them you have the big ones the ones you wanted to catch were in the the 100 125 you know the smaller ones because those are what the restaurants really liked you know those big ones that you know that's a lot of meat since I was Irish Catholic I went to Catholic grade school, and then I went to a all boys uh, Catholic high school in downtown Seattle called O'Day, uh, which is still all boys today. It's a sports factory now, so there's a lot of uh, a lot of famous alumni like Freddie Couples, the golfer. He was a few years behind me, but uh, and Nate Burleson, who's uh, ESPN analyst uh, or um, you know on TV or, or you know, for football I mean you know, so there's there's a few boy, you know those old boys running around my parents wanted me to go to Seattle U it was two thousand dollars a year I thought it was horribly expensive and I didn't know what I wanted to do so I opted to go to a, to a local a local college uh, instead like I said and I thought I wanted to be an architect, and I found out really what an architect did. And so I said, well, I don't want to be in an office, I'm going to be a civil engineer. And uh, so I started down that path to, for uh, civil engineering to, with the idea of transferring uh, to the University of Washington. I was just a nice little college student until one day I got home and Lo and behold, in the mail was report to, for a physical. Um, I was uh, that uh, my student deferment didn't get renewed, and I had a nice low number in, in, in the lottery. And uh, if things look good, I would get an all-expense-paid vacation to Vietnam found out that um, 
there was a moratorium put on the renewals, but they thought it wasn't going to hold up in court, so I'd have to do the physical, and there's probably a reasonable chance that I wouldn't get drafted. You know, it, the, the, but there was still, you know, a, an opportunity for um, for that to happen. So I beat feet for my local uh, reservists and uh, found that the Navy Reserve was uh, an option. So. Um, they shipped me off to, um, I signed up with them and found out I only had to do four to ten months active duty and it was all school time. So they sent me to Naval Training Center Great Lakes, Illinois, um, and put me through electronic school. I was an electronic technician radar, so, which turned out to be a a really, really good investment uh, for me in that I got to learn an awful lot about electronics, um, which I was able to apply in uh, at Red Dot. So um, that's kind of uh, something that I had no idea when I started down, started down my career path to be a civil engineer that I'd end up being an electronics guru. When I got back from doing my years worth of school and active duty, I went back to school and uh, civil engineering wasn't the place to be. In fact, the program that I was in had been dropped um, because of the early 70s not a lot of construction and what have you, so um, I looked around and, and we had taken a tour as part of a survey engineering class of different main companies in the Seattle area. Packard was one of them um, and uh, went to Boeing and I saw what the mechanical engineers did room as far as the eye could see of drafting boards and guys in uh, white shirts and smoking pipes and, and at, sitting at drafting boards the size of, of a door uh, and said, no, that, that does not look fun. Went in the next room, as far as I could see, those were the electrical engineers. Again, crew cuts, white shirts, pipes, no. Nope. Went down on the, on the production floor and, and there were these guys that had their own offices and were, were out doing problem solving and, and things and they were manufacturing engineers. I said, now that looks like a fun job. One of the um, classes I took uh, for production planning uh, was sheet metal fabrication and they had a heater from this little company called Red Dot Corporation. And so we planned out how to build, build this heater out of sheet metal. And I was used to, um, after being in the Navy, having money and, and not being just a college student. So um, some inter uh, there was an internship that came up and I and this other guy um, applied for it. We were both qualified, so they held a, um, a coin toss, and I lost. There was an internship for a company called Mantel Gearworks, and um, they were, uh, and I lost. So the professor felt sorry for me, so he says, gave me this card of this crusty old guy that owns Red Dot and told me to go see him. So I did. And uh, he uh, offered me a, a job. And some 40 some years later, I was still interning there. My first job was um, 
I got to design a paint conveyor. They, they used to paint the products because they're a small operation. They just put them on carts, roll them into a paint booth, paint them, and then have to pull them out. And uh, so I designed a paint conveyor, a chain conveyor, you know, uh, that went through the paint booth. So you just hung the parts on it, came through, the guy painted it. And they came around again, they were dry enough to take off. And, and I thought that was a pretty crowning achievement. It lasted two months and the building caught on fire and that portion of, of the plant burned down. Even though the Harky, the owner, never actually got to see the conveyor in use, he was in Mexico at the time we, we, we took it live and, he was there and it was only a few weeks later that we had the fire. So he got to see it in a crumpled mess. If you go to Red Dot today, its bigger brother is, is there. When I joined Red Dot, we were, uh, we were a three million dollar a year company. And um, uh, we started growing and um, we ran out of space. At, we rebuilt the factory, we ran out of space and um, I became uh, director of manufacturing um, and so it was my job to find a new place. So we found the facility that Red Dot is located in right now at, at, for, in, down in Tukwila. The We went from a 60,000 square foot facility to a 150,000 square foot facility. And uh, I thought it had plenty of elbow room. And the first time I took Harky through it, he looked at me and he says, Hanson, what do you think we're doing? Building aircraft? He says, Jesus, this place is huge. He says, you can't even walk from one end to the other. We're going to have bikes like we had at Boeing, you know. And he says, and, I, and that over my dead body. And we looked around and he wanted to build a building and then we started in and the environmental regulations and said, heck with it. Let's go back and look at that building and we bought it and it's still there today. And so uh, that was, so then we set about, you know, converting it uh, to our, our type of manufacturing. The building had previously been used for making the insulation for the Alaska pipeline. It was owned by, or leased by Owens Corning. So a little different manufacturing than ours. Uh, so we laid the whole thing out, you know, plumbed it, ran the electrical and, and, and what have you. And uh, that was my crowning achievement as a manufacturing engineer. And it's, it's still running today, pretty much the same layout. So after we got the plant built and it was, you know, running and it was doing, I figured, God, I got this made. You know, I, I'm director of, uh, of manufacturing, got a couple hundred people that report to me. I mean, yeehaw. And one day the owner walks in and he says, Hanson, I want you to take over engineering. I looked at him like, you got to be serious. You can't be. What? I said, those guys. I said, and I had just a great relation with them because I wouldn't ask them anything unless we were totally lost. Because whatever they told me, I was convinced was wrong. But it was, you know, if, we were, if we were dead in the water, at least it was a place to start. You know, so you can imagine the mutual respect that, that, that manufacturing and engineering had under me. So he says, you do it, and you do it right. And uh, I'll, make you, I'll make you a vice president. Okay. Maybe he does. <laughs> So I took over engineering and uh, I'd had a little 
a little previous experience um, designing things because I was talking about electronics and how it how it kind of helped um, in visibility at Red Dot back in 73 after we burned the plant down we were all in in trailers out in, out in the parking lot because the offices burned and uh, I overheard a conversation with the engineers one day they were they were talking about um, wouldn't it be great to have some form of electronic temperature control in our units and uh, something that automatically ran the fan or whatever. I took a, a thermistor from a, that, from a TV and uh, breadboarded up a little, a little circuit that basically, if you turn the dial and, you t and the dial said it needed more heat, the fan would speed up. And when it got to temperature, the fan would go to low. And they thought that was cat's meow. And, and the owner just, he went nuts. He thought this was so cool. Invited the chief engineer from Kenworth to come over and look at this. <laughs> and next thing you know, we're, we're putting it on Kenworth trucks. In 1975, he saw his first digital clock. And he said, what would it take to make a digital clock? And being a smart ass, I said, oh, can't be that hard. Now, mind you, there was no, car, there was no digital clocks in any car. Nobody, you know, digital clocks were, were alarm clocks that you had, you know, for your bedroom. So I created a digital clock. Uh, in fact, I took the chip out of an alarm, out of a digital alarm clock, because the first clock we built had an alarm and a calendar in it. We built, actually ended up building three different model clocks. We had a, and they all fit in a 209 Stuart Warner gauge, so you could drop it in the dash of a truck. We sold the business in '79 to a company that, an electronics company. So. Red Dot wasn't particularly adept at, at building electronics, but for three years we built, we built digital clocks. They ended up being far more popular in motorhomes because what we had done is for the alarm clock version, because they were so small, I put a relay in for the alarm so that you could just trip a sound alert buzzer and because it had a relay in it, what the motorhome guys did is they figured, hey, we can use this to energize one of the outlets so you can pre-program a coffee maker. There was no programmable, co I mean, you know, coffee makers back then were just electric drip makers. There wasn't no Mr. Coffee or anything. And uh, so they, they figured out how to set one of their their outlets you know in the kitchen and well it's on a timer we sold a ton of them to holiday rambler you know travco i mean, remember all those we had had a bitter bitter taste uh hark the owner we were when i first started we were in the motorhome business with a company called open road and then uh, red dot was building 1200 units a month for them. That's, that was huge. And all of a sudden the oil embargo showed up and they tanked and we had material coming out our ears. And I remember it took years for us to get rid of all the defrost hose that we had. And Harkey said, we are never going back in the motorhome business again or my dead body. That was always as famous, yeah, so we didn't. And in that same period of time, I built the company's first computer. So, which was an interesting 
a little story in itself in that Harky would sooner be over my dead body, we'd have a computer. Uh, but he saw it coming. So he gave me a personal check. He says, I want you to go learn about them. Here's the money to do it. You know, nobody is to know about it. You say anything, you know, you'll be on the street. Uh, but, you know, you're a smart guy, figure this out for me. So I did, and he says, when you get all figured out, let me know, I'll bring it in. So the first thing I did was I, I built this, built this uh, computer, it's a, it was the same one that, uh, uh, that Bill Gates and Paul Allen had. I bought the kit, you know, soldered it all up, built it all, bent the sheet metal case at Red Dot at night, and then I wrote a, a basic program uh, that did payroll calculations. Because payroll was all done by hand back then. So I wrote a program that, you know, you could put it in and it, it would do the calculations for it. And uh, showed it to Harkey. I thought it was pretty cool. He showed it to the bookkeeper and they just, oh my God, what a time server. What? Oh, oh, this is so cool. You just type in this number and out comes that number. Oh. So anyway, so we got to bring it in the building. And that's how I, the other half of my job was, I had IT for, for 40 years at Red Dot. I took over engineering, started working on, on different projects and we got pretty good at designing things. And I got into uh, building um, different ways for us to test our products. Because we really didn't have any, we had no way of, um, of, of really qualifying a lot of our products. I mean, it, it was just trial and error in, in, in a lot of cases. Um, and so the first thing we did was go down and, and figure out that Boeing had a really nice environmental chamber. Uh, and uh, it was right down the road and we talked to them and they, thought it was pretty novel, you know, uh, that we would want to use it. I mean, and it, it could go to 30 below, no problem at all. So I remember rolling our first Kenworth vehicles in there and uh, getting a real education at low temperatures. One, they don't start real well. Two, Anything made out of plastic is really, really brittle, and you end up with the door handle in your in your hand and, and the door not closed because all the rubber seals are rock hard. And uh, so we 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 learned we learned a great deal about cold weather testing along with testing our product. We began to develop test methodologies, standards, and it really helped our products. And also demonstrated to our customers that, you know, we, we knew what we were doing. But it seemed like everything that I ever came up with was, was really technologically out there. We um, partnered with Parker Hannafin and developed uh, a refrigerant management system, which was probably the crowning technical achievement in my career. Um, this, this was, looked, looked like a overgrown expansion valve, but it, it was an electronic expansion valve that had the ability to sent, sense moisture in the refrigerant, sense the charge level, and was an electronic expansion valve that would meticulously manage the refrigerant. You know, it was an incredible piece of technology, but the cost versus the benefit, we, we could never make the case for somebody to spend that type of money for it. So we broke it apart and we used part of it, uh, the refrigeration charge level technology and product we call Protec, which the U.S. military uses, is the biggest customer of. We came up with the technology. It was rather, 
rather amazing. I mean, it was so cool working with the engineers at Parker because they, they did some amazing things like um, when trying to um, control refrigerant flow electronically without using a whole lot of current. You know, they came up with a, what they call a balanced force orifice so that the load, the refrigerant uh, pressure wasn't directly applied to the uh, solenoid device. But how he came up with um, refrigerant sensing uh, charge level is we would use um, a thermistor, simple thermistor, but put it in, in a cavity that was part of the refrigerant flow. So as the refrigerant flow density changes, meaning less liquid, uh, more gas, that, that change in density we could sense with the thermistor by self-heating it. So we would heat the thermistor, uh, the amount of current that it would take to heat that thermistor was different if it was in liquid versus if it was in a gas or somewhere in between. So we found we could sense a charge level with an accuracy of about 10%. And that product's still in, in production today. But we had it so simple that for, you know, like the military, I mean, you're out in the middle of nowhere you, and, and it's on a vehicle that doesn't have, you know, electronics. You can just look at the blink codes. I mean, if it's blinking red, that means, you know, refrigerant's going bye-bye. And the idea was is to give them limp home capability, tell them before they're, you know, before they run out of refrigerant that, hey, something's happening, you're losing your charge. You, you know, you need service. We actually became involved with Max through NARSA, you know, the radiator folks. So uh, Red Dot was started from a radiator shop, West Seattle Radiator. So the owner was obviously an NARSA member and, uh, and Red Dot in the early days was half owned by Stuart Radiator out of San Francisco. So there was a tie there. And uh, so when Max kind of formed, um, we were, you know, were members. Um, but it wasn't until I think around 95 uh, that the heavy duty program, and we were part of the first presentations, you know, on heavy duty. Before then, because we were in the aftermarket, we, we had aftermarket units and parts. Uh, a number of our distributors were also Max um, members, so it behooved us, you know, to be part of Max. And I remember in the early days, I mean, you could walk the trade show in three minutes. It wasn't real big. It was interesting because we're part of a MAC, and a MAC was kind of what was was the large organization. Max was small, and and, and the scales were tipping. Then Max decided that um, heavy duty, you know, needed to be a part of the the program and. Uh, and uh, we were on board with that. And I think I've been at every, since the middle 90s, been at every Max event since then. It's been really interesting to see it grow and change over the years and evolve. Oh, I knew Simon, yeah, I sure do. I knew Simon very well. We were also part of um, SAE. You know, I've been an SAE member since when I ended up taking over engineering and I figured I better join SAE, yeah. but you had the interior climate control run by this guy named Ward, and uh, where where we really got involved, and you see Simon what was uh, when we needed to change from R12 to to a new refrigerant uh, called 134A. All the horrors that that was going to be set on the industry. We were all part of uh, that interior climate control committee and the wars that went on over that. But lo and behold, uh, 
we managed to stay in business when we switched away from R12 to 134A. I mean, the cars beat us, you know, um, but we weren't that we weren't that far behind with the trucks. I mean, there's you know, automobiles are always kind of the leading edge and then heavy duty. Once we figured out that the world wasn't going to come to an end and that we weren't going to have to redesign the entire system, went pretty easily into, into, the, into the transition. So the past four years have been, been on the board um, and that's been a really interesting experience. I see a lot of, lot of transition and, and, and seeing a lot of uh, really neat things that Max has done to become a really professional and r recognized authority you know, in, in World Air Conditioning. I mean, it's, uh, it's neat to have, you know, seen that from, uh, from the inside and, and, and how it's grown, you know, um, the uh, clinics, you know, and, and what have you. We, we held the first, you know, heavy duty um, road show, if you will, at, at, at Red Dot. And now, you, you know, you look at it, how well they're attended and you see the impact that uh, Max has, you know, on the industry. And it's, it's really cool to be a part of that. When I retired shortly thereafter, I retired from the board at Red Dot. The good news is YF isn't a technical issue, okay? It's just, it's just an economy issue. If, if you look at the, the charge that goes into a heavy duty piece of equipment, the refrigerant charge or a commercial piece of equipment, you know, where they're dealing with pounds versus automobiles that are dealing with ounces, you know, in today's marketplace, which is, you know, starting to improve, but when the refrigerant is the largest single cost in a system, there's not a lot of motivation. Once that changes, if the refrigerant costs between 134A and YF, the closer they get, the more comparable, you know, at some point in time, it's, it's gonna tip over because it, it makes economic sense. That to me is the primary driver. The only other one, but I don't see it in today, would be a, a regulation. I mean, obviously, if there's a, a government regulation that dictates something, then that you, you know that option all of a sudden it becomes set, a second. The economics, right? You you got to you got to you know do what it, you're legally required to do. But today, there's no legal requirement to change refrigerants, and the economics just don't make sense. Uh, the the heavy-duty vehicles don't have the credit you know, incentive like the automobiles. Why they switch? Unless you have some sort of motivation like that, it's going to be down the road. But everybody's investing. There's testing going on. You, you'll hear it, you know, at this conference. Just like, you know, last year we 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 gave a presentation on, you know, YF and in some of our our systems you know what what the difference was and what have you and there's more and more of that being done by by OEM so people are are preparing for it but it isn't going to tip until until the economics get closer or a government regulation comes in and says thou shalt not use it, it has really been an interest you know I don't know that he could have ever written a script, you know, when you look back at your career, the, the things that impacted it, what have you, some of, the, some of the things that we did, you know, like with Max, before YF existed, CO2 was the chosen path. You know, we looked at it and you know, we had nothing against CO2 until we really kind of did a deep technical dive and figured out that CO2 and, uh, heavy duty piece of equipment, those two technologies just unmatched. You know, we were part of a renegade group that brought forth, you know, 152A, you know, as a, as a potential alternative. And, you know, the, the nice thing was, I like to think that it, it put a placeholder for 1234YF for that, so that decisions weren't made and, and a course of direction charted that would have been really, really 
difficult for everyone, you know, that we brought up, um, you know, a viable alternative using secondary loo, you know, and even direct expansion with that, with that refrigerant, you know, we, we demonstrated at Max, I think in 2005, I think it was, how difficult it was to actually ignite that refrigerant. We spent eight hours and we finally used a blowtorch in a cab and pumped the refrigerant raw into it to, to get it to, you know, uh, to ignite. Uh, in 2004, we introduced at Max, you know, one, uh, a 152A secondary loop and direct expansion system. That was an interesting time. We actually made uh, a number of systems, 152A systems, and put, put them out in the field in Australia. Well, they were part of, part of a consortium, EPA, Max, and uh, um, the Australian government, the greenhouse office. We got a hold of one of the aftermarket guys and have a, had him make us a can tap, and then we went to Costco and bought dust off. So we'd send two cans of dust off and, and a can tap with every unit. They went to mines off highway. They, they were off highway rooftop. And like I said, the rooftop was introduced, I think at the 2004 Max in Orlando. And we sent it over. And the, inter the interesting thing was, it was the first time we, what we did is we mounted the compressor to the back of a off highway rooftop unit so that, and then hydraulically drove the compressor. So what happened is the refrigerant loop was so small, we, could, we, had, we never had enough refrigerant in the entire system to equal the LFL of, of the cab. So that was how we got around on direct expansion. I mean, if, if you didn't use enough refrigerant and the cab was, was, was this size, if you dumped the entire charge in there, the, the concentration level was still too low. You'd never have you know, any, any reason for ignition. It turned out that that hydraulically driven rooftop is, is a product today with 134A. I mean, people loved it. I mean, we put it out there and we said, hey, this thing works pretty darn good. This is really cool. We don't have to run refrigerant lines all over hell. You know, hydraulics is easy. We just hook up to the pump here and away it goes. It's a little noisy, but I mean, but hell, the whole machine's that way. So. You know, our customers spend hours a day with our climate control system, not minutes. You know, the cost of repair and downtime on a commercial vehicle. I mean, we had, we used to have a, a customer that would literally, as part of their annual maintenance, rip off a perfectly good air conditioning system and put a brand new one on every year just because the cost of that air conditioner was so minuscule to the cost of that machine being offline that they didn't want to take a chance. The guy looked at me and he says, this machine's offline, it's $20,000 an hour. How much is your air conditioner worth? I can put several of them on there for the cost of that thing being down. I mean, they just replaced it. Brand new compressor, new red eyed unit, hoses, everything, just brand new. So it was just, just good business sense to him. You know, and he used the same units. He, w he wouldn't buy the OEM systems. He put the same units on all his equipment. So his techs knew we had bungee cords on the lid so that during a shift change, they could lift it up, blow, blow all the dust and debris out of the, out of the air conditioner when they're, you know, that was, that was their whole thing, uptime. You know, when you got some of that, those large haul trucks and, and, and those excavators, you know, they're several million dollars. We, we, we did start in 2004. We, we never did military really prior to that. In the very early days before Red Dot existed, Harky actually did made heaters for the Minuteman missile trailers. Uh, you know the tra the command centers for the Minuteman missiles. Uh, 
he made out of his radiator shop. He built uh, he built heaters, you know, to keep those uh, to keep the electronics and the people in those those trailers warm. So, so that was that was our military exposure, if you will. 2004, we're in in our you know in Iraq with Humvees with canvas tops and doors and you know the Humvee was was built to be a military support vehicle not a patrol vehicle so when out on patrol and people start shooting at you you know canvas doors don't work real well and grenades you know dropping a grenade on top of a canvas roof you know there's there's not whole not a whole lot of protection so the military you know developed uh, up on what they call up armor kits bolt-on armor for for the Humvee and turned them into rolling pizza ovens so they would literally get so hot inside that the driver they had to put an IV in the driver to keep him awake when they were out on patrol you know he could get to 145 inside that you know, you can't roll down the windows, can't open the doors. And it happened just happenstance in that one of our distributors put an air conditioner, a red dot air conditioner on some other piece of military equipment. And the military was getting these ridiculous bids from, and no bids from their normal sources you know, on, on air conditioning. And somebody said, well, who did the air conditioning for, uh, for this project? And he said, this guy. And so, well, let's talk with him. So he went in with our, with our sales manager and he came back and two weeks later, we developed a kit for them sent them their first kit and they were just like, holy cow, what's this? And they tested it and you know, they said, well this, this works, this is great. Hey, we wanna make a deal. So that meeting happened in January. We shipped our first production shipment in early April. Four months, we developed a kit tested it, got it approved through the military, started up production, and we were building somewhere around 600 kits a week and putting them in the air. Uh, and these were complete kits. I mean, they came with tools, everything. In fact, Sandin, that compressor that we used of theirs is still the fastest turnaround design project they've, they've ever had. Uh, they turned it around. We use easy, easy clip fittings. We ran them out of, we bought every tool they had. They had to actually send people over to Europe to get more tools because we were, we were buying, we, we bought them out. Because we shipped a set of tools with every air conditioner. So, I mean, the, you know, you had everything you needed when that, when that box arrived. You just didn't know where it was going. I mean, because they had pockets of equipment, you know, all over. We built the first one without a Humvee, and then they sent us one, and then there, we had to design for different Humvee variants, too. So, there was a pickup, there's the four-door, I mean, so, um, so we had different kits for for different ones and then what we did at red dot is the military starting with the marines they were the first guys to get the kits they sent in uh, their their techs and we we trained them so we had all the humvee variants on the in our test center and so each day they'd put they put on and take off that variant and then we taught them how to charge and service. We'd actually had a Humvee in our environmental chamber at 130 degrees because 
they, refrigerants behave a whole lot different at that temperature than they do sitting out in a shop environment. Uh, but that was, that was a lot of fun to get to meet uh, the guys. Uh, you know, so we trained up a couple of contingents of Marines, several of, of the uh, Army, and then we tra trained up some uh, um, contractors that the Army had. It was funny because uh, a couple of uh, employees at Red Dot, you know, had sons and daughters over there, and they refer to the air conditioners as Red Dots. You know, we get pictures back with with them in their Humvees, you know, the machine guns and the Red Dot logo. They came in designer colors of either desert sand or forest green. So depending on the Humvee that it was going on. So we could put our name on it, but we, we couldn't put anything identifying what was in the box because they didn't want the bad guys to know what these were so that, oh, they're air conditioners. So we'll go, we'll start blowing up their supply of, you know, of these things. We like them roasting in those, uh, in those Humvees. Once they figured it out, I mean, shooting at condensers and things of that nature to, to take the air conditioning out, you know, so. We designed a, a rooftop condenser, and one of the requirements was enough ground clearance so that a grenade could roll underneath it or out the other side. They'd be sitting on an overpass, they go underneath and drop grenades off the overpass onto the vehicles. The condenser we put on those vehicles was the same we use on a fire truck. So literally, they could shoot one of the fans off and the condenser would still run, or it could be half plugged. I mean, the idea was that you had way more capacity, but you're also dealing with something that had to, had to de you know, work favorably at an extremely high ambient temperature, so you need a lot of condensing. That was an interesting time. I've, over 20,000 of those systems running around over there. New home bees were being built with air conditioning systems on them and then the military realized that a Humvee wasn't really a good vehicle for off highway because when they put all the put all that armor on an aluminum chassis it didn't hold up real well so they developed a vehicle called the MATV for Afghanistan and, and places where off-road requirements were and the MATV came with a factory installed red dot system. And the new generation Humvee, the JLTV, is, uh, is also a red dot system. I used to get in you know, these lively discussions with component manufacturers that come in and, well, this air moving device has been qualified by Ford and, you know, and if it, it's good enough for them, I mean, it's gonna be really good enough for you, you guys. I mean, here's our test and I look at, yeah, yeah. These tests are run in hundreds of hours. We run in thousands of hours. It's a, this, this, won't even, this won't even get through our warranty period. It means every one of these I put on, I'd be buying another one. Years ago, I built a, a blower test stand so we'd find out if the 6,000 hour blower motor that we were using was really a 6,000 hour blower motor and, and we'd run our products along with our the, the components we'd find in our, in our competitors too, just just for benchmarking and it, it was pretty interesting. We learned an awful lot.